Um, really, what is all the hype about coming out? What I wanted to tell you is that truth be told, I'm an African American man. I'm a Native American man. I am a leather wearing, cigar smoking, motorcycle riding mus musician who happens to be gay. I'm a married parent. I'm a Wiccan. I'm disabled. I'm immune compromised. And I'm a military officer. I also happen to be on faculty here on this campus, right, which is telling us a little bit about what this campus does. If you stop by my office and you've seen the pictures of my family on my desk, or you've been to events with me, or you've seen me riding around campus on my motorcycle, or wearing my leathers, or wearing my uniform, you may already know all these things about me. So for me, it wasn't about coming out publicly to you guys, because I'm already out. Everyone knows, that knows me knows me, right? What this coming out thing is, is really about this immensely personal experience of coming to grips with who you are. In many ways, that personal experience then goes out to larger, broader communities. Like, if you didn't know me, you may have just found out something about me that not everyone is aware of. So it's a process of standing in your own truth and in many ways insisting that the world recognize you for who and what you are and not because of a particular label in, in, in particular. So, um, and not necessarily wanting the approval of other people, because quite frankly, I don't care what you guys think about me. I am who I am, and I'm going to keep on living my life. But it's really kind of cool to be able to interact and have exchanges and to be comfortable and, and to be able to stand here before you and say, I am who I am, right? And you are who you are. And we should respect each other for simply being humans. Um, this panel up here is an, actually a really special group. It's a panel of activists and leaders um, that have come to our campus, and I'd like to welcome them here. Um, all of these folks have worked diligently throughout the years on various causes that are of particular concern to the LBGTQ community. Um, in full disclosure, I have a personal relationship with every member or, or representative organization here. Um, for some, it's been traveling around the world, around the country to various events and simply to just have fun. For others, it's working together and training to learn how to do political campaigns. Um, for some, it was sitting on the lawn at Meriwether listening to a Queen concert. Um, for others, it was a simple lifeline. There was this hotline when I was 19 years old in Baltimore that I could call. When I, had, when I was struggling with issues about who and what I am. And that organization is represented here today. Um, for others, it was an organization that I, I partnered with when we went to the State Senate to uh, testify on behalf of same-sex marriage in, in the state of Maryland. So I have a personal connection and relationship with each of these individuals and each of the organizations that I can represent. And I'll take a moment and just introduce them briefly. All right, so I'm going to start down on the far end. This is Jen. Uh, Jen is the operations manager at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center of Baltimore. Um, she's a recent Maryland transplant, originally from South Carolina, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Her experience includes internships at the Human Rights Campaign and the so uh, South Carolina Equality. She graduated from Columbia College in South Carolina with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology. At Columbia, she was a recipient of the 2013 Spirit of Inclusion Award for her diversity work. Jen lives in Jopper, and when she's not working, she's an avid nerd and jazz trumpet player. Sitting next to Jen is Tamara Shea Oatman. Tamara is the Vice President for Operations for Bottom Line Solutions, a small minority-owned management consulting firm. Um, she is also the co-president of Metro DC PFLAG, um, and she's been on several boards, including So What Else DC, Young Women's Project DC, and NAMI, Montgomery County. She's an experienced former executive from nonprofit organizations as well as state government. She's recognized for abilities in consensus building and organizational development. Her primary work uh, has been in contract management, strategic planning, business development, performance improvement, change, transition management, management, employee coaching, and team development with a special emphasis on problem solving. Keith is, has a long history of LGBT advocacy and leadership uh, in issues campaigns starting in his home state of Texas. He came to Equality Maryland after four years of working on climate change, uh, on climate change campaigns with the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, as CAN's Virginia field director, he managed the organizing team to advance renewable energy policies and take on the Commonwealth's uh, dirtiest polluters. Before joining Equality Maryland staff, he served on the steering committee of the Maryland Coalition for Transgender Equality, a coalition of over 50 organizations working to advance equal rights for transgendered Marylanders. In the past, he was also a lead organizer for Basic Rights Montgomery, the campaign to uphold Montgomery County's trans anti-discrimination law, and he worked for Equality Maryland on a trans anti-discrimination bill in 2009 for the state of Maryland. So the next to Keith is Dana. Dana is a retired eye surgeon who was a candidate for the Maryland State Senate in 2014. She's currently the executive director of Gender Rights Maryland, the state's trans political organization which worked uh, the gender identity bill to passage in 2014. She has served a term as a senior advisor to council members Trachtenberg on the Montgomery County Council, 
She is chair of the National Advisory Board of Freedom, Works, uh, Freedom to Work and writes a weekly column for the Huffington Post. She recently served as rule, uh, on the Rules Committee of the National Democratic Party and has twice run for state de delegate in Maryland for District 18. Lane has been an advocate on public health issues, including research on the effects of DES and endoc endocrine disruptor disruptors on human sexuality and reproduction. Dana, these are way too many syllables before my coffee this morning. <laughs> uh, and she was, Dana was also the lead staffer passing the first countywide ban on artificial trans fats uh, in the U.S., a ban that extended nationwide later, the year, uh, later this year. Dana has been the VP of Equality Maryland and Maryland Now, uh, an HRC governor and a board member of Mobile Med, uh, the National Center for Trans uh, Transgender Equality. She's currently on the board of Kishet, a national Jewish LGBT organization, and a steering committee of Progressive Neighbors in Montgomery County. And last but not least, H. Alexander Sattery Robinson is president of Robinson and Foster Public Interest Consulting Practice. Sattery Robinson served for five years as executive director and chief executive officer of the National Black Justice Coalition. He attended Pennsylvania State University where he holds degrees in accounting and political science and an MBA and, an MBA, and is a graduate of Stanford University Executive Pro uh, Program in Leadership uh, at the Rockwood Leadership Institute. He's an active volunteer. He served for two terms as pre as with President Bill Clinton's Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS and as secretary and two-term treasurer of Whitman Walker Clinic in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, Whitman Walker is an HIV AIDS program in D.C. He's also treasurer of the board of directors for the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty and as an acting executive director for the Reservoir Hill Improvement Council and Community Development Organization based in Baltimore. Please join me in welcoming this distinguished panel. <laughs> All right, so I emailed the panel some questions, and I'll just throw these out very quickly um, so everyone knows sort of where we're going. Uh, and then if any time you guys feel that, that uh, you want to ask a question or get some clarity, throw up your hand and I'll come back so that we can, we can get you on the mic. All right. So the first question I asked our panel is, what are the most pressing issues from your perspective as relates to LGBTQ matters from a local, state, national, and international view? Who would like to open it? Well, from a parent perspective, um, I represent PFLAG, parents, family, friends of lesbians and gays. And what, what I failed to include in my bio because I was in a hurry is I'm the proud mother of a gay 29-year-old son and the proud surrogate mom of hundreds of young men and women and transgendered men and women who I have met over the years. And from our perspective, what's still missing is an atmosphere of love and an environment that is accepting of each of us for who we are. We all deserve to be loved and admired and appreciated for who we are. And, and that in, in really uh, summarizes what PFLAG stands for. And despite all the great improvements, great changes we're seeing daily, it's exponential change, there's still a lot of frightening, disheartening things happening in the country and in the world. And we're here to provide a loving environment. And I, I see that still missing in a whole lot of situations, a lot of schools, a lot of religious institutions, a lot of organizations like the Boy Scouts and others. Um, so from our perspective, it's we're about love and there's still a lot of that missing. I also couldn't agree more. I think that's a really good way to put it. A lot of people um, at the state level here in Maryland, now that we have marriage equality and we have a fully inclusive anti-discrimination law, think that the work is done. Think that we check off these legal boxes and all of a sudden everyone's free to live equally without discrimination. And we know that legal equality is one giant step to take but now we need to dig in and work on the issues of lived equality and make sure that people are free to be their full selves. No LGBT person can be reduced to just their sexual orientation or just their gender identity. We are LGBT and other identities. So we are really digging into where those intersections lie, getting into a lot of racial justice work, still working on immigration, because we know that there are LGBT immigrants who, if they're deported, that could be a death sentence. We're also getting outside of the Montgomery County and Baltimore and helping out and really learning what folks who are LGBT and live in the more rural areas of Maryland, what are their needs? What are they still facing? And that's gonna be different for Chestertown than Frederick or Allegheny County or Garrett County. 
And so we're really working with, in depth with these communities to figure out what are the issues day to day. Another project that has been really overlooked um, is the trans Latina community. So we are doing a needs assessment of trans Latina women and figuring out out of all of the issues, healthcare, discrimination, documentation, all of these, what are the top priorities? And so it's really figuring out what do we need to do to live equally in addition to having legal recourse for when discrimination does occur. Following up on what Dr. Terry and both Keith and Tamara said, I think the most important lessons you can take from this are you need to lead an authentic life. And as a critical part of that is you cannot care what other people think about that. To me, it took me 40 years to get the courage to transition, and I didn't have it because I was afraid of what others would think. It's a simple thing for me to say now, having done it, but I realize how difficult that was. Coming to your own authenticity, willing to stand up with pride and speak to your parents, speak to your siblings, speak to your kids, speak to your friends, is probably the most challenging but most rewarding thing you can do. Keith is absolutely right. Legal equality is one thing, and we're very fortunate in this country. The trans community has full legal equality with respect to employment nationally, but making that a reality, changing hearts and minds of people who are in business, who are hiring and firing, is a huge step beyond that. But having the tools to do so is also very important. When you go into a job interview, if you know that you're protected in your county or your state or due to, your federal, or due to federal legislation or, or court uh, advances, you have a great advantage to be able to go and say, you cannot treat me this way. But you need the self-confidence. You need to be secure in who you are to be able to do that. There's an issue people are talking about now in the national media about whether or not women should ask for raises at work. Our issues in the LGBT community are just really a small drop in this. I, I believe that homophobia is, basic, is based on misogyny. And until we can actually resolve the misogyny and the sexism in our society, we are still going to struggle as LGBT persons. Women need to be able to stand up and say, I deserve a raise, just like any man can. So all of these issues really get down to your feeling confident in yourself, being able to go out and ride your motorcycle, and wear your leathers and do whatever it is you want to do with your life, as long as you're respectful of others, and then stand up tall and proud. You come out, you speak out, and you stay out. That's what changes the world. As marriage equality sweeps this country, that's going to be the next step. As people come out, get married, live in their communities, not in community centers and urban areas, but throughout this country, in the suburbs, in the exurbs and such, that will slowly change the character of our culture for the better. I found this a rather uh, challenging question to answer because it encompasses so many communities. So I'm going to speak to this uh, primarily from an African-American perspective um, and say that for African-American gay and bisexual men, HIV and AIDS continues to be one of the primary leading issues uh, and challenges that the community faces. If you look at the demographics of who's becoming in, in infected, African-American gay and bisexual men are on the leading edge of that. If you look at who is infected and doesn't know it, therefore transmitting HIV to others and not uh, getting the appropriate innov innovations uh, and health care uh, to extend um, their lives, the African-American gay and bisexual men are a leading uh, edge of that. So I, I think that that, can, is like my fellow panelists here, um, a lot of the issues that have impact the larger community, whether that's racial inequality um, or um, uh, bias and prejudice, uh, affect us in, in this context. If you look at African-American uh, transgender uh, individuals, <clears throat> according to uh, one survey, um, about 34% of African-American transgender folks reported household incomes of under $10,000. A large percentage uh, reported being homeless um, in, in, a, in a period of time. 
Um, there are <clears throat> policing policies uh, that in uh, many cities across the country have been established uh, to uh, improve, as they say, the quality of life. Many transgender individuals, whether or not they are actually engaged in, um, in, se in sex work, um, are swept up in these new policing policies. Many of these are African American transgender people, again, who have either chosen, uh, found the sex work as the only option, or are simply in the neighborhoods or near the campus or perceived to be because of their appearance uh, being engaged um, in sex work. So uh, as my federal panelists have said, uh, even though there are lots of legal protections that are in places, in, in many places, discrimination still um, exists. And nowhere do we see that more as in, in employment. Um, and again, if we're speaking from the African American perspective, we know that there's still racial bias, uh, we, it, whether that's cultural or because of bigotry. Um, and gay and lesbian people who are, who are uh, also are of, uh, from any uh, minority population, African American, um, disabled, uh, Latino, recent immigrant, um, have that additional challenge. So if you're, if you're entering into the work, workplace um, and already having to overcome what might be someone's prejudice because of your race or your ethnicity or your religion, um, adding on to that your sexual orientation or your gender identity, um, it, it continues to be an additional challenge. Um, as they've touched on, we work with a lot of, I did this through the eyes of my center, and we touch on a lot of homelessness. Um, LGBT youth are, that are homeless um, and trying to make homeless shelters in Baltimore and Maryland um, inclusive and understanding the issues that these people face, because a lot of times trans people especially will not go to a center or a homeless shelter because they don't feel safe and they'll be gendered with their biological sex. So um, that's an issue that we're facing. We're trying to work on the AIDS and HIV and trying to be more transparent with the trans community and the sex working. Um, we're also working towards domestic violence against gay men, which I think is a topic that often gets overlooked because women are the number one people in the United States who have intimate partner violence, especially bisexual women. Um, so those are some of the issues. Um, nationally, some of the issues I see is uh, gay marriage, obviously, is a huge issue, especially for my, where I come from, in South Carolina. Um, and what's next after marriage equality? What's the next big sexy topic for LGBT rights? Because marriage equality is sexy, like it sells papers, people read it. Um, internationally, you know, it's Uganda and Russia and people just not understanding LGBT people. And I don't know how in the United States we can make that a more broad topic and like talk to other countries about LGBT people and get some more knowledge and maybe start those building those relationships as LGBT activists. But those are the things that I see. <laughs> so if anybody has any more input. Jim, thanks. That, that was actually a great segue to the, to the next question that I'll, I'll pose to you guys. And that is, are, are there things we're doing here locally in Maryland and in our region um, that could, in fact, impact uh, the rest of the country or globally? Well, to segue from the global point that Jen makes, which is very, very important, although we always run into the problem of we're not doing enough here, as everybody's yeah. pointed out. Yeah. With HIV, we now have prophylaxis, and we're debating that within the community, whether that's a valuable tool or not. As a physician, I believe it is, but there are some very solid arguments against that. Globally speaking, we are here in the D.C. area. It's a huge advantage. The State Department runs programs. I've been privileged to meet with activists from South Africa and from Latin America on many occasions. For them, just the fact that we exist, that we have these organizations, is a beacon of hope. They just love it. We can explain our experience. We can give them tools to take home. But when they get home, they're really under the gun. You mentioned the worst of it, whether Uganda or the Soviet Union, and now Kyrgyzstan is coming out with them. But actually, there were a group of activists yesterday in DC who met with the officials in the Kyrgyz embassy in DC. We can have a huge impact, and you can give five or ten or twenty dollars 
to any of these LGBT groups around the world and make a huge impact, far greater than happens even in this country simply because of a difference in cost of living. So anything you can do, anything that touches you where you can reach out to help those communities where, as Jen mentions, they're not even respected simply for being who they are. You can't even talk about being gay in, in Russia without risking your life. So there are many, many ways that we can actually be of a help, and particularly since we're around DC here, we can actually have a huge impact on foreign affairs. I, Keith and I, I don't know if Keith knows this, we're both from Texas, and when you compare what Maryland's doing and has done to Texas, uh, even though I love my state, what have we we're, done to Texas? we're, <laughs> we're so far ahead in you Maryland. <laughs> um, and just three things off the top of my head. We have, uh, just a reminder, Maryland was at the top on marriage equality. Um, I remember calling my son that day, you can get married in Maryland now, and he said, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Um, we have uh, a template for, for trans legislation. Dana can speak to much more eloquently than I can. And at a more local level, we've done a lot of work with Montgomery County Schools on inclusive curriculum. So we're sitting, I, I think Maryland is a, a beacon for the rest of the, not only the country, but the world. And we, our particular chapter also includes Northern Virginia and just comparing these two uh, very close areas of the country and the differences and the things our Virginia brothers and sisters are struggling with, beginning with marriage equality, much less all the other issues. So I think Maryland is, is a, I'm, I'm very proud to be in Maryland. And to add to that, but also get back to something that Jen said about marriage equality sweeping the nation. It's a really hot and sexy issue. People love it. I think in Maryland, we can set a template and show other states what the work looks like after marriage. Really set that example of what does it mean to transition from marriage equality and do the hard work to change hearts and minds so that in South Carolina, someone won't be fired for putting their wedding picture on their desk because that's what they're looking at. Once they can get married, if the culture is still discriminatory and there are no legal protections from discrimination in places like public accommodations or in housing, then we can show what we're doing successfully to continue making real change and continue to show the country that real change continues to be necessary after marriage equality. I don't think it's any accident that um, the NAACP uh, being based in Maryland was one of the leading African-American organizations that came to uh, the position of supporting marriage equality. And that that work that was done um, both at their national headquarters, but also with African-American ministers and pastors uh, here in Maryland, um, has translated into changes throughout the country. And I think that that speaks to sort of that community um, uh, impact and influence um, that individuals can have that uh, can extend whether to the uh, country or to other countries uh, throughout the world. Can I just, please. Individuals, each one of you can make a huge difference. What Alex just said, the NAACP, this is, we're privileged to have Professor Julian Bond in this area and then Ben Jealous in this area who also had a trans family member. These individuals who took control of their organizations simply by being there and leading were able to help change the world. And that doesn't even begin to get into what Barack Obama did when he came out and said that his kids told him that their friends at school have gay parents, so what, what's, what's your problem, Dad? And that really set a steamrolling change in motion. But the critical thing is the marriage equality that's sweeping America today, and that covers 30 states and probably will 35 states very shortly, is due to the fact that nearly 90% of Americans know a gay person. When we were kids growing up, most Americans would never admit to that. I mean, they knew, they go, well, yeah, you know, Joe's kid is a little light in the loafers or whatever, or somebody in the choir, we know they're a little different, but nobody would actually come out and say, yes, I know a gay person, my neighbors are gay people. 
Today, people have neighbors who are gay people, gay couples, gay individuals, their kids go to school with them. That changes everything. We're not there with the trans population because the trans population is only 8% of the LGBT population. It's probably a lot higher because pe fewer trans kids are willing to come out compared to gay kids these days, but that will probably change. But still, we're much smaller, so it's going to take longer to have more people know us as individuals. But I think that's the crux of real progress, live reality that keeps talking about. When you know somebody, it's much harder to be upset with them. We were talking, Tamara mentioned MCPS. I was part of the team that worked on getting sexual orientation included into the curriculum. And then we did gender identity, and we had to fight an extreme right-wing backlash in order to accomplish that. After we won that in 2006, they then turned on the trans community because they were looking for something else to get an edge on. MCPS, for all of its great work in accepting the curriculum, it was not easy to get them to do that. And there are still problems in schools with bullying because the principals haven't gotten the message. The other administrators haven't gotten the message. The teachers are still awkward dealing with these kids. And it's simply going back to what Jen said, what's the next issue going to be? It's, I think, all about gender expression, gender nonconformity in a whole broad sense of what that means. So some kid who's got curly hair and glasses is going to be bullied in fourth grade because kids are going to say, oh, he's gay. Even though that's nonsensical in fourth grade for them to say that, we need to be able to step up and actually go out there and make those changes in the community. We've changed the regs. We've changed the laws. It's not enough. We have to go out and show up. Um, as you guys should be aware by now, this is the year of social justice at Anne Arundel Community College. Um, how can we as individuals, and, and uh, Dana mentioned a little bit about this, how can we as individuals take an active stance towards social justice, particularly as it relates to LGBTQ issues? Talk. I think it starts with talking. Um, and we touched on it several different ways here. It's really important that people know how you self-identify. Um, if you're not LGBTQ, you are an ally. And if you consider yourself an ally, talk about it. Tell somebody. The more we talk about it, the more things are going to change. The scariest part, there's still a, a very small percentage of young people that are comfortable even coming out to their parents. There's been a recent research on that. And uh, it's just shocking to me that still so many young people feel frightened, insecure, whatever. And some of them are not so young, and some of us are not so young that are having to deal with coming out issues. But that's one of the things that PFLAG is here for. If you don't feel like you can talk to your parents, or it's, I said we should start an aunt support group, because I get an interesting number of calls from aunts uh, whose <laughs> niece or nephew has come out, and her, the aunt's sister or brother or the family is not dealing well with the issue. So frequently there's an ally somewhere in the family, uh, and, and more times than not, they're not that surprised, but I understand the fear, and, and some, in some cases it's very real physical fear. So that's one thing we can do. We serve as surrogate families, surrogate parents to help you get through that. We've, we've talked to parents. We've, we're willing to do that wherever they are in the country. We have, there are a lot of grandparents. We have a, a support group that we're now calling community group at a retirement community. It's really the first in the country and many of those folks are grandparents of LGBTQ people and they, have, they dealt with it and in many cases much better than their sons or daughters did. So talk and vote. Those are my two pieces of advice. There's election coming up. It's hard to get enthusiastic a lot of times, especially about down ballot races, but school board and things that may not seem that uh, uh, topically of interest to you really have major impact on things like the curriculum. So find out about the candidates and vote. I think speaking up about a topic that you see that's not being addressed, um, I'm a huge trans advocate for women's colleges and because I went to a women's college and we had trans students, so they're not being addressed and they aren't given the proper protections. So speaking up about whatever you see that's an inequality, um, bisexual people are often erased. Um, we're told that we're just straight women or 
you know, were gay men in the closet. So that's a misconception that, you know, we're trying to, as a community, get away from because it's not true. Um, and just speak up, be open. Um, I'm very out, obviously, I'm up here. <laughs> so um, be out, tell your story because your story can help that person who's listening and you never know who you're impacting with that story. So that's my little tea. Uh, I would say, you know, become intolerant. Uh, intolerant of bigotry, <laughs> intolerant of of scapegoating individuals uh, because of who they are, uh, you would be uh, surprised at the impact that you can have when you speak up uh, on behalf of others. So we all have had the experience where someone tells a racist joke, makes a bigoted comment about a gay or lesbian person. That can be a very uncomfortable place to speak up um, in, in many cases because your own sexuality, gender identity might be questioned if you, if you speak up, but your willingness uh, to speak up and to educate. Uh, in some cases, and it, you know, particularly uh, from a generational perspective, we're talking about ignorance. People uh, having uh, believed, have been taught, have come to um, think that the bias that they have, that the stereotypes that they, that they uh, believe or espouse are true. And so your being willing to speak uh, truth to power, your being willing to be out and open as an ally in your family, among your peers and colleagues, um, you never know who you're talking to, you never know where. Um, the people in those, th those rooms are going to be next. Um, they might, that might be the moment in which someone is educated, someone who is going to be a decision maker in the future, someone who is gonna have the capacity to give someone a job, make a difference at a traffic stop, be a future, le future legislator, um, might have a turning point uh, in their ability to embrace uh, individuals uh, for the diversity uh, that, that exists and who they, for who they are as individuals. Um, what is important for students and colleges to be aware of as regards to uh, LGBTQ issues? I think, well, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think a huge one, um, especially in a women's college setting, because some people you know, go to different schools after this, is what are we gonna do with trans identified persons when they come into our college? Um, one school has defined it as it's based on your self identity, but a lot of women's colleges are very still like, you're born female, you are a female. Um, in recent years, we've seen a Smith student who applied get turned down because his FAFSA forms or her FAFSA forms said that she was male. Um, so that's a huge issue is also like bullying um, in schools because Adults do it too. I mean, people bully other people throughout life. So how do we step away from being bullied and how are we going to identify those students who are being bullied and ident identify those bullies and get them out of our school systems or address the problem that's there? Um, and another is you know, being friendly to trans persons, allowing them to use bathrooms and school facilities um, as the gender that they identify as. So I think those are huge ones that I've seen. We have a program called Safe Communities Program and it, it focuses, it's a training and it focuses primarily on suicide prevention and anti-bullying. And I think it's critical at this level. And it, you may be surprised, but it's very critical in the workplace. It's, it's not, there's not an age issue. People are bullied at every age in the workplace and suicides are happening at every age. And the LGBT community is at at much higher risk than the community at large. So training, uh, training that empowers folks and gives you the skills, and the training is not for the teachers or the professors uh, solely, it's for the students, it's for the PTA, it's for the bus drivers, it's people that are, are in our community. We're, all, we're a big village and it takes all of us to help each other 
be successful in this life. So I would strongly encourage something similar to Safe Communities Training. One of my um, sort of concerns about where the movement is going, and so this to me goes to what I hope is happening on college campuses. Uh, because I believe that we need the leadership of think young thinkers who are going to be somewhat outside the box of people in my generation who have been working on these issues for a long time. I mean, one of the concerns about marriage equality is that, um, in, let, let's be real, we have a lot of mostly white, gay men and lesbian women who have means for whom marriage equality almost sort of puts them outside of the realm of discrimination. Right? It doesn't mean that they still don't face some bias, but if you have access to resources, access to uh, health care, and now your family, your property, your home, all of that is sort of protected in, under this sort of historically traditional um, institution of marriage, a lot has been achieved, and that's, that's great. Um, but the movement that I joined um, around gay issues was also very much a movement around sexual freedom, about uh, a, a movement of feminist thinking, uh, of challenging gender roles and gender identity. Um, and some of that is, is lost right now. Some of that is, is not sort of what you're reading in the paper because Often, when we talk about marriage, it's how gay and lesbian people are just like everyone else. We're just like our heterosexual counterparts who want to get married and have families. So I'm a married man, you know, and I'm very happy um, to have my male spouse. Um, but, but I'm not, and we are not, just like our heterosexual neighbors. That's, that's untrue. Now, we're just like our heterosexual neighbors in that we want a safe neighborhood. We want to protect our families. We have a lot of the same values. Um, but we don't come from the same place. They're, they're, they, we don't have uh, the same aspirations uh, or, or identical aspirations about the future. So I do believe that uh, the, the, the opportunity that exists now, the opening that uh, individuals on college campuses who are, who are thinking about whether it's criminal justice issues or social justice issues or the way in which we shape our public health system, um, the way in which we, we talk about how families come together and how the laws, whether it's family medical leave or COBRA or access to social security or any of those things, the way in which we administer those public uh, policies in the future are things that, that really we need leadership on in order to, to innovate and make sure that the progress that we made isn't lost. Um, because I think that what we, if we look at the African American population here, it's one of the challenges that we face. In our, in, 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 uh, for all of the progress that we've made in in, uh, in legal protections and in achieving educational achievement and becoming the president of the United States, um, we still face uh, police brutality. There is still discrimination. We still are disproportionately uh, poor, um, have um, negative health outcomes. And a part of that is that in the success, you still need to continue to lift up uh, the least uh, among us. And so that's what sort of my hope uh, for college campus design. No, I like that you brought that up, Alex, that I, the progressive movement when it began in the 19th century was an economic justice movement. And many of the benefits of that have accrued to my generation and to yours as well. But you have new challenges. You have just paying off your loans as a critical issue for you going forward. This is a multi-trillion dollar problem for this country. And in America, we have, at least for the past 150 years, always focused on education as a way out, whether it's out of you know, 
racial discrimination or just poverty and all the waves of immigration that have come, that's now becoming priced out of the range of your generation. That's unacceptable. I would encourage you to fight for economic justice. The fact that we're raising the minimum wage over the next three years in Maryland to $10.10 an hour is inadequate. You need to go out there and say, that's not enough. We want to have our own lives, we want to fight for our own lives, but we need you to stand up to the impact of big business on our lives. This is Citizens United, that Supreme Court decision. You're, you don't own your, your country anymore. Democracy has been corrupted by money in this process. The presidential election two years ago, $2 billion. I mean, this is, and 73% of super PAC money was given by only 100 individuals in this country. Hundreds of millions of dollars controlled by fewer than 100 people. This is your democracy. You need to reclaim it again. I want to thank Jen for the work she's done with women's colleges. This is an ongoing process. For years, women's colleges allowed women to transition to become men in their safe spaces. Mm -hmm. They were really safe spaces. Smith was, was the leader in that. Yeah. But fortunately, over the past few months, Mills College took the lead in recognizing that trans girls are women, too. And then Holyoke followed up on that. This is a process, so if you know anybody in any of these schools, contact them, get involved, make a difference. Talking about campaigns, elections, and your democracy, Tamara's absolutely right. You need to vote. Some of you may not be old enough to remember when just 527, 29 votes counted in determining the President of the United States. That's a unique example, but we can say from just working in state legislatures and county legislatures, oftentimes it's that one person. You could be that one person. Your relationship with a legislator on a particular committee can make the difference between getting the minimum wage, rage, minimum wage raised or not, or getting anti-discrimination protections. We had, it took us eight years to pass the gender identity bill, primarily because we were one vote short in one Senate committee. It took one more vote. The rest of, we brought the rest of the legislature along, years and years of grassroots work and such. They finally got it after the, the gay agenda was finished and marriage was finished, but there was still, we still needed to get it out of one committee. And it took years of relationship building to do that. But you never know with whom you've gone to high school, you know, with whom your child is on a swimming team somewhere, those relationships can make a world of difference and only one vote makes that difference. So never think that you're not important enough because you could be the most important person in the room. So the, the next question I have on my list is why are events like coming out week, like we've had here at campus, coming out day, transgendered awareness, prides, leather pride, gay pride, kink pride, why are these things important and why do we do them? So I can touch on pride. Um, pride's a huge thing that happens in Baltimore. My organization is, runs Pride currently, um, and it's our biggest fundraiser. So by going to Pride and supporting these organizations, they get out there, you know they exist, and it helps them f raise money, um, let you know about their events, and maybe possibly volunteer with them. So that's the hugest impact of Pride is that it sometimes it makes an organization run. You never know who you're paying for or what you're contributing to. You know, you buy a beer at Pride, it might go to somebody who really needs it and who's doing this work to try to make somebody else's life better. So that's why Prides are important, I believe. <laughs> Some other people might have other issues and things, but that's why Pride's important to our organization especially, so. Well, well I'll say a, a little different and for the people that just came in, PFLAG is about creating an atmosphere of love and an extended family for anybody in the LGBTQ community. And pride for me in the three years I've been involved, I have hugged more people, some happy, some very, very, very distraught than I have in the first 50 years of my life. And it's been fabulous. And so all these events, I've never been to one of these events that at least one person and in Pride, it's hundreds that come through, come out of the, the audience when we're walking in the parade, who come to our booth during Pride. And we have a hugging booth. I mean, we made it front and center, and we hug literally 
anybody that comes by that we can. And so many people that it's so nurturing and it sends a message that there is a community here that loves you. And, and these are not all kids. A lot, of, a lot of folks are way older than I am and they're saying, I wish my mom had been like you. I wish I had a mother like you. I wish, you're, I wish you could talk to my mom. And we are here to do that. But these events create an atmosphere where you're sort of, I assume, looking around and seeing who's here. And there's a, a bit of affirmation just by being, just by being in this room together. Tamara, can you share with us what PFLAG is? Not everyone PFLAG made. is parents, family, friends of lesbians and gays. And of course, the, the, the uh, LGBT uh, moniker is now extended to LGBTQIA at least. And I, I'm going to make a correction of the way I introduced myself earlier. Uh, as the mother of a gay son, I'm the mo proud mother of a queer son, and we've had lots of political discussions and talked this week and this, about how he introduces himself and how I'm going to introduce myself, and I am the proud mother of a queer son. And Jen, could you just share what the organization is that you're with? Um, I work for the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender Community <laughs> Center of Baltimore and Central Maryland. It's a very long title. Um, and our acronym is the GLCCB. Some people just call us the center. I'd like to say about PFLAG, this is an important point, as you expanded the, the acronym there. PFLAG was the first national organization to reach out to the trans community back in the mid-90s when they got a lot of grief for it. Much of what we're talking about, this is a successful event here. We're, we're, we're out here and we're talking about problems that exist, but we've made incredible advances in the 45 years since the Stonewall Uprising. But getting there was not that easy. And I think that's important for you guys to know. There are challenges ahead and you need to talk about it and you need to argue about it and debate about it. There's no one way to do this. And as Alex pointed out, your generation is going to have to come up with creative, innovative ways to deal with the challenges that face the society, particularly on economic justice. There's no easy way to do it. We fight in the community. Occasionally it bubbles up in, into the mainstream media and people notice, but generally it doesn't. But that's what communities are like. That's what families are like. You're going to do it. You need it. You can't just have conformity. Certainly the LGBT or the queer community can't talk about conformity because we don't conform to anything. But our movement has been to normalize our roles in society so we can choose to do whatever we want. I was at a fundraiser for Lambda Legal last night, and the point was made, even with marriage equality sweeping the nation, it's simply we've been fighting for the freedom to marry, not for the necessity to marry, not for the obligation to marry, but for the freedom to do it. Every child growing up, gay or straight, should be able to say, one day I can get married if I want to, or not. Right? That's important. We lose sight of that because it seems like everybody's getting married. We get invited to all these weddings and such. But the number one industry in the gay economy now is gay divorce. That <laughs> may sound silly, but that's life. That's what this is all about. And Jen mentioned it, things that she's dealing with, intimate partner violence in the LGBT community. It's even greater than it is in the straight community. Oppressed people suffer from what has been called oppression sickness. And we fight amongst ourselves. And even when you're in a partnered relationship, sometimes the stresses of not being able to get a job or even getting married and then losing your job because you got married. This has happened. People who teach in Catholic schools have been fired when they announce that they've been married to a same-sex partner. And then they've been outed as a result of that. And they lose their jobs because there are no federal protections on sexual orientation issues in this country. So your identity as a gay person is not protected against employment discrimination. There are lots of problems that exist. You need to move forward, but realize that getting from point A to point B is never easy. So don't ever give up. Be yourself. Don't care what anybody else thinks about your identity and fight for your, your liberty and your equality. Uh, Alex touched on this earlier, and Dana just did also, but the national marriage equality movement has largely, for better or worse, put forward this, we are just like you, so don't be scared of us. It's OK to let us into marriage. And coming out day, pride, as, and all of the prides, I like that you mentioned like leather pride and various ones, are incredibly important to say, this is our full community. We are not just this one idea 
of what it means to love or what it means to be LGBT. So that right now, the average ally walking down the street who has their, you know, ally pride is a thing now with its, its own flag, um, which I might have some thoughts on. <laughs> but they think of this one idea. I personally am not that one idea of what they're thinking of. I don't want to get married. I'm a transgender man. And when we come out and say, we're going to force you to be OK with how diverse our community is, it furthers equality for everyone. So it's still incredibly important to say, we are not just this one idea. We are everyone. And everyone is welcome in this movement. Okay, so let me, let me piggyback on that, because I actually wrote down the comment here. Is it just in your face when we're doing these, these prides and types of things? Re reiterate what you just said and the importance of why, we, why these prides occur and, and the role that they play in our society. Yeah, they're incredibly important. We still, over and over here, well, I'm okay with people being gay as long as it's not in my face. Sometimes, you know what? It needs to be in your face. We need to be proactively saying, this is who we are. Because when someone says, I'm OK with it, as long as you keep it quiet and in the bedroom, what they're saying is, I'm actually not OK with it, but I'm going to overlook it. That horrible part of you, I'm still not OK with that, which means they're still not OK with LGBT people. And if we let ourselves be shoved back into a closet and say, we're just like you because we're going to hide this part that's different, how much progress are we actually making towards LGBT equality in this society. That process is called covering when you're sort of when you're out, but you're not really out. You don't put your spouse's picture up on on your desk at work and stuff. You're sort of you know you're trying to maneuver, mm -hmm. trying to pass as straight or, or what have you in society, and it does eat at you, right? Taking the pride internally, though. Again, we were discussing this year at, down at DC, which pulls, what, a quarter of a million people mm -hmm. to the festival, and the parade is always huge, people throwing beads and all that. And it's great fun. And a lot of people are saying, why do we need this anymore? It's 2014. I mean, after Windsor, really, do we need pride? And somebody came up to us as we were having this discussion and said, I just came out last year. This is my first pride. This means a huge amount to me. And you mentioned not only ally pride, but this year in DC, there was a mile's worth of religious organizations mm -hmm. coming out for their community. The first time and ever. And for space. That's right. <laughs> first, it, was, it was amazing. People were looking at that. I mean, you know, Southern Baptists of uh, uh, Fairfax County. Or something. I mean, it was amazing to see all this variation. This pride gives an opportunity for people to come out not only to themselves, but to the community at large. And it's a safe space in which to do that, particularly when you have your mayor, or your congressperson leading that parade, that makes a big difference to say, oh, it's okay, we can come out here now. I also think like pride is something very important. It's a historical mark for the LGBT community. It was originally started after the stone like the year after Stonewall. And they were out and in your face. And some communities, like where I'm from, they need that because they're often forgotten. Um, you know, if you in South Carolina, if you're not married by law um, and you come to South Carolina and you're gay, you got married in Maryland, your marriage certificate's invalid. You're not a married couple. Um, if you get intimate partner violence, it's, a domestic it's not a domestic assault. It's a harassment charge. So therefore, statistics are wrong. And you know these organizations and these people need to be in that face to say, no, we're not going to like let you walk all over us with your religious right, which is sometimes the issue. But we need protection, too. So I think it's important that they're in their face. And it's important that they let them know, like, hey, we're still here, and we're still fighting, and we're not going to stop until we have everything that we need to move forward. And even then, it's still very important. I would well, say I, one I, other I, quick thing, and that's that it's very different experience being an observer, a spectator, than being a part of whatever, this event, pride, whatever. And it's, it's not the same in your face situation if you in any way are plugged in and a part of what's happening. Whether you're part of the planning, whether you're marching, whether you're on a panel, whether you're asking questions, 
it, you, you get a whole different uh, experience and it's life changing, I, I guarantee you. So I, that would be the other thing I would encourage you to think about is whatever it is, whether it's an event like this or some pride related celebration, figure out a way to, even if you're not totally comfortable, tiptoe into it and get have some actual involvement rather than watching from the sidelines. It'll change your life. Um, I, I would also say that my first um, pride was in San Francisco. And um, I was not um, out at the time. Um, and, you know, San Francisco's pride parade at the time, and I think still, uh, is led by Dykes on Bikes. So, you know, that's the first thing you see down Market Street, which is the main drag in San Francisco. And so I would say a couple of things about Pride. It's an opportunity for people to come out, certainly in a safe space. Uh, everyone needs a point of entry. Uh, but it's also, at least in my experience, is an opportunity for whatever sexual orientation of woman to take a shirt off in public. It's an opportunity for you know the straight guy who really thinks that he should be able to wear his Speedo down Main Street to do exactly that. Um, it's an opportunity for self-expression um, that is not offered in many other venues. Um, and that I, I've seen people come out in all sorts of ways, not just about their sexual orientation, but about the fact that they enjoy kinky sex or that they enjoy the company of, of people of their own gender um, in a way that maybe is not accepting, even though it, it, broadly, even though it's not sexual, um, that, that they are religious. So in fact, um, gay Catholics, gay Buddhists, gay atheists, um, showing that in fact there's a group of us who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, who still are a part of the Orthodox Church, who are still, who, who are atheists and proud to speak that uh, to, that into the community. So I, I think that just like any other um, racial, ethnic, cultural um, need to come together to have a shared experience, it's also an opportunity to experience the diversity um, that is within the community, um, to have people see, you know, I have a point of entry. I can come here as an African American because there are other people here who have my not just my sexual orientation or my gender identity, but have a similar uh, childhood experience, community, neighborhood, urban, uh, educational uh, experience. And so I can speak to them and be able to integrate myself in a way and expand uh, who, who I am and come to a better appreciation of what uh, others have to offer uh, to my experience. Well, you're never going to get the church as a whole to agree on anything <laughs> if you're talking about all of it. And, but there are many and a growing number of churches from all religions that are uh, accepting and affirming. And so that's the first place I start. And we have, have begun to have more of a focus on faith communities for that reason, because we often get a call from parents who say, my child has come out, they're, gonna, they're going to hell. My church preaches they're going to hell. And so if they're Methodist or Baptist or Jewish or whatever, Catholic, we find someone in the faith community that can talk to them who has uh, scripture to go with it if they need that, who has living experiences to go with it. So I think it's growing and it's changing. And that would be my suggestion is to first not try to change a particular church, but figure out how some other churches have done that and get that sort of as a template. You implied the difference between belief and organizational structure. Somebody can believe whatever they want regardless of what their particular preacher, minister, rabbi says. Judaism has the advantage in that it's decentralized. There is no one church, so to speak, so you can believe whatever you want and within the Jewish community there are multiple denominations that are fully accepting of the LGBT community. 
when it comes to, say, the Catholic Church, you may have noticed that this Pope Francis dude is, is kind of a <laughs> different kind of guy. And on Monday, the Vatican came out with a, the first draft of uh, a policy statement in Latin and in English and such, <laughs> saying that, you know, gay people may not be that uh, perverted or deformed as we had been led to believe. And then when the right wing here in this country, the conservative Catholics in this country, most American Catholics aren't, by the way, but the churches, you know, respond to that and say, how dare you? Well, they, they sort of translated the Latin a little differently into English, but they didn't change the Latin. So this is how the process goes. It's a dialectic. You know, you come out and you make a statement that your thesis, then somebody responds, it's an antithesis. Then you've got some new synthesis that becomes the new basis, and you keep fighting. It's, I think, our responsibility in whatever church we exist, if we do or not, if we're atheists, to fight within that particular community. I would never go into an African-American Baptist church and say, you need to treat your you know, your uh, community members better. That's their responsibility. You know, there are some places where that's effective and where it's not. I won't go into a white evangelical church unless I'm invited to talk about these issues, but it's my obligation as a Jewish woman to work on my own community, to talk to the rabbis, to deal with these issues. They're very, very difficult. But the scriptural problem isn't as severe as it seems to be because there's really, when it comes to homosexual acts, it only refers to man scripturally, and there's only one sentence that's repeated. So, you know, you've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of sentences in scripture, and people who are uncomfortable with gay folks are focusing on one sentence. You can deal with that. Rational people can evolve, and they don't abide by everything that's in the Bible anyway, so we can, you know, you don't stone your child for speaking out against you, so then why are you going to be homophobic? There are ways of doing it, but you have to engage people where they are. So it would make no sense for a Jewish woman to come into a Catholic church and start arguing Catholic doctrine. People need to know, bring their own history and their own knowledge in to argue those issues. I was looking up something right quick, just a sort of a plug, and it happens to be in Virginia where we have a, an event next week, one of our community groups, and they're showing and having a uh, program, it's called Before God, We Are All Family, and it's also in Spanish, Ante Dios Todos Somos Familia. And we have a, another focus for us at PFLAG this year is reaching out specifically to the black community and the Spanish-speaking community, and we're going to be creating community groups for Spanish-speaking parents. So imagine you're dealing with maybe faith issues and language issues, and your child has just come out to you. And there really isn't a good place in terms of our mixed community groups now, so we want them to have a safe place where people speak their language in more than one way, to talk about these things, and here is one opportunity. And there, there are many of those out there if, you know, if you're interested in finding some of them. One other thing I would say about religion, though, is that you know, what we, we have the opportunity to, to truly create a secular society and to have secular government. Right? Because as much as I support uh, anyone's uh, ability and freedom to practice their religion, one of the challenges that we face in sort of our, the, our society is, is the places where we have collapsed our government and our it, governmental institutions and laws with religion. So yes, you know, the idea that it says in God we trust on, on, on the money is, is problematic. The idea that the presidents and everyone else closes out by saying God bless America is problematic because religious beliefs are very personal, very communal, very much based in sort of history and the like. Our secular government is the response to that. And so um, you know, my perspective on this is that we need to truly have a, a, the, the separation of church and state uh, where we don't have this sort of collapse and financial support in the way of providing nonprofit status, in giving, um, in providing free land to religious institutions, because that's 
the way that that's the way in which we impose um, religious beliefs, religious doctrines on uh, individuals who do not believe and who ha or who have very different uh, belief systems. And speaking of Texas, since we have two <laughs> Texans here, ongoing today, this issue of separation of church and state is evident in Houston. Houston passed an anti-discrimination ordinance. Actually, it's first ever. They had no anti-discrimination or ordinance with respect to race, sex, national origin, anything. This one was a broad human rights ordinance that included sexual orientation and gender identity. And a group of right-wing conservatives petitioned this to referendum, including a group of five pastors of fundamentalist Christian churches. So a group of attorneys this past week working with the city there are issues of whether the signatures were valid on this petition. They often aren't. We know that from Montgomery County and Baltimore County and Maryland in general filed a subpoena for all the documentation that these pastors had regarding this ordinance, including sermons. This became a very, this is a very, very touchy issue. So you have a group of pastors that have been preaching against this ordinance in their churches, taking a political position in church, which they're really not supposed to do. It's not illegal. They're not allowed to support particular candidates. They could lose their tax-exempt status for that, but they, they're getting involved in the political process. But because of that, a group of attorneys, as part of the legal process, have demanded these documentations, and now they're crying religious liberty. You have no right to attack me for whatever sermon I gave, but this is now a legal process, and under discovery, actually there is a right to do it. So this is a clash between secular and religious that can, can get very, very ugly going forward. Fox News is talking about this all the time when they're not screaming about Ebola. So <laughs> we, this is a serious problem in this, in this country, and you may be aware of the Hobby Lobby decision, which deals with religious exemptions to to other anti-discrimination laws and stuff and contraception and all of that, this is going to be a critical issue going forward, probably for the next decade or so. And the ironic part about the Houston instance is that that discovery and the subpoenas were part of a lawsuit because the opposition, including these faith leaders, filed a lawsuit against the city when they denied the petitions. So they started the entire thing and now are crying, oh wait, but you're gonna actually investigate us or treat us as if we're part of this legal process? That's not fair when they initiated it. There are organizations in this area like Whitman Walker and Chase Brexton that are particularly adept at dealing with this because they're culturally competent. So they can treat somebody who identifies as queer and deal with their depression and their bipolar condition and maybe their schizophrenia, whatever it is, without that patient feeling, oh God, you hate me because I'm queer. That's huge. We've been training, gender, gen, tr training therapists over the years to deal with gender issues. And there are more and more now, it's very difficult not to be able to find somebody who has at least some training in gender identity and gender expression issues once you've got that, you can create a safe space where you can deal with a client or a patient who has all these other issues. You talk about suicide, there's the Trevor Project. There are national organizations that do that, but I do believe that ultimately it's going to matter to have enough people on the ground so that in your community, if you have an issue of substance abuse and many queer kids self-medicate, right? Because they're embarrassed to come out, they haven't come out, and they don't deal with their other emotional conditions as well. It's going to take time to do that. I teach medical students. There are many people working on this problem, but it will take effort. I would suggest the Trevor Project for nationally speaking, but then you've got locally as Chase Brexton and you've got uh, and Whitman Walker, which has become a full service medical care provider. As Alexander used to be on their board, discovered they've evolved. The Affordable Care Act has changed a lot of things. Right? And people are, there are few, fewer uninsured around. So a lot of this is changing. Ask, just call people up, you know, call psychology departments at universities and such. Generally, there will be somebody there who knows. There's an organization dealing with trans people called WPATH, 
the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and we've got people all over the world that deal with this that provide resources in various communities. Um, the GLCCB does have AA programs that deal with just LGBT people and um, AA. Um, we also have a Narcotics Anonymous program, um, and we refer people when they call, um, and a lot of our calls are for services. So we definitely refer them to Chase Brexton because we know them and we know that they will treat the client with respect. Um, we also recommend Hearts and Ears, which is another LGBT mental health program, and it's free. So a lot of people come in who are homeless in our center, we're like, they need extra care that we cannot provide for them, so we'll try to set them up with these services so that they can get that proper care. So there are organizations working towards it. It's just, it's such a big problem that we have to tackle it one person at a time, so. I also think it's really important for advocates who focus on LGBT issues and advocates and service providers who focus on substance use and mental health issues to work together and be proactive about working together. Outside of Whitman Walker and Chase Brexton, both of which are fantastic, um, there it, it's a lot of informal, oh, I happen to know that this center or this doctor is LGBT friendly. A few weeks ago, um, we got a call from a caseworker that uh, one of her clients had been kicked out of her recovery home for being trans, and she was going to end up on the street that night if we couldn't help find somewhere to go. And it was in Dorchester County on the Eastern Shore. And it was through informal networks again, and we called the PFLAG chapter in Chestertown and said, hey, who do you know of? And they called people they knew. And finally, we were able to get two or three um, referrals of where this woman could go and have a safe space and not end up on the street. But it's because we were all building those bridges and working together to make sure that we can have some kind of at least informal network, but we do need to be on both sides proactive about continuing to work together. Well, you know, what, one of the things that I, I would say is where do you go? Well, you join the Citizens Review Board. You make sure that when there's an opportunity for an election for the next person on the police commission, that there's someone who is competent. You know, going to the earlier question about um, substance abuse, I mean, what competence, cultural competence, is so critically important, right? Because even, aside from the regulation, a, a, a culturally competent and open police officer has an extreme amount of, of latitude to react and respond to what they see and can often use the existing codes to have an impact. Even though it might not be optimal, they can still have some success. So um, integrating into those environments where those choices are made, which often aren't, you know, for many folks in marginalized communities, for young people in particular, you know, the idea of being on the police commission or being a part of the Citizens Review Board might not be sort of the first thing you think of, but, the, but there are real opportunities there to begin to sort of impact the thinking in the culture, because just like any other um, institution, you know, law enforcement, um, there, there is a culture there, there and, and that culture has to be uh, infiltrated, if you will, uh, in order to make those changes and in order for the law enforcement themselves to say, we don't have adequate training, we don't have the tools, the laws don't match what we're seeing on the street, because that's when the legislators, the policymakers begin to have to rethink what they're doing and it can move the needle, if you will, on, on, in some of these areas. Another access point would be the Maryland has a commission on civil rights. Many counties have offices of civil rights and human rights, and they may have within themselves committees on hate violence. So there was an attack on uh, a gay male couple in Montgomery County, which is pretty safe space, and those guys complained and they called the Office of Human Rights, and that got the ball rolling. You develop relationships with those folks, you develop relationships with the police. As Alex mentioned, for some people that's very difficult. You don't want to go anywhere near them. 
But there may be others in your community who, because they are public leaders, maybe elected officials, or have served in, other, some other, in some other form, have these relationships. They put you in touch. You sit down over a coffee with the police chief for half an hour. You can make a huge difference. You can actually get people engaged where they th never thought there was a problem because they were simply unaware that this was an issue. But you have to be willing to stand up and say something about it. it if you're just victimized and you can't speak out or there's nobody willing to speak out for you, these problems keep getting put under the, under the carpet. In DC, for instance, there was a terrible experience with Tyra Hunter back in 1995, I believe, where she was left to die on the street by EMTs. And that led to lawsuits, but it also led to trainings. And those trainings occur every few years. Police departments need this kind of cultural competency training. It's not an easy thing to do, though, when money is tight, right? So you're going to spend money, you're going to spend it on a, on a tank that Homeland Security is going to give you that you can play with, or you're going to spend it on cultural competency training. You have to have people within the system who are willing to push and say that's important. And getting back to the mental health issue, I know Tamara's work with NAMI and such. I have worked with the Family Justice Center in Montgomery County. We do need to have more of an emphasis on LGBT people. And I think there's now an awakening to the fact that this is important and that they're beginning to want to do it. So you've got to make those relationships work so that people from inside are willing to step up and say, we need on our board, within our community, to step, reach out as well. And I think we're getting to a point where we can do that. Um, I want to leave you guys with one thought, and it's, one, it's a thought that I opened up with. Yeah, you see this coming out as an immensely personal journey. It's a journey of acceptance of who you are that often results in public disclosure on many levels and throughout your lifetime. Simply as people see you, as simply being who you are, being you and standing in your own truth. It is a process of insisting that the world recognize you for who you are, not for their approval necessarily, but simply because you're human. And I think that, it, for me, it sums up this whole experience for the last week of, you know, why do we have this coming out thing? It's because we want the world to accept you and us, and all of us, as simply being human. Any last words from our panelists before we, we close? Thank you for having us. All right, absolutely. My pleasure. Let's please let's thank Jen and Tamara and Keith and Dana.